to be one of your speakers on your lectureship program that you're having this year. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, being able to speak a few years ago and when Andy sent me a message a couple of months back, I've been looking forward to the time that we could spend together once again. I am, am so grateful for the great work that the Phillip Street congregation has been doing for so many years. Your stand that you take for the truth, your elders that you have here, your ministers and all of the great works that, that are involved with this congregation. Uh, thankful so much for, uh, for everything that you do. A couple of things caught my attention uh, within the last uh, several days. One of them within just the last few hours, Andy, as he was closing things out last night, he said that for lunch today that we'd be having fried chicken and barbecue. Uh, I am from Memphis, and so barbecue is one of the four major food groups. Uh, that's uh, something that we thoroughly enjoy there, and so I'm looking forward to that. And then also you've heard that if you preach the word, you've got to be able to eat the bird. And so I'm looking forward to the fried chicken as well. Uh, we had our gospel meeting at South Haven this past week, and on Wednesday night I got to meet one of your members. Uh, Jeff Schultz was with us, and got to meet him for a few minutes, and then got to talk with him a little bit more last night. And uh, we're thankful that our paths crossed over the last, uh, last few days, Ronnie told me a little bit more about the Schultz family last night, all good. But I uh, had a great uh, dinner with one of my classmates, one of my dearest friends in all the world, Ronnie Scherfus. Many of you know Ronnie and uh, the good work that he is doing over at Glendale. And I appreciate uh, the good association that you have uh, with those folks over there as well. I really wish my family could be here with me today. Uh, but one of the things about having a family with three small children, uh, it, it's difficult on mama, especially uh, even when you're at home, but even more so uh, if you go on the road and your surroundings are different, they're new, and uh, things along that line. And so hopefully you can understand the difficulties and the challenges that, uh, that would be there as well. And so they are, uh, are back at home and worshiping at South Haven this morning. Our world is constantly changing. And when we think about the way that our world is constantly changing, there, there are several aspects that we could talk about in regards to that this morning. For instance, when you think about technology, what's the old saying about a computer? If you buy one today within six months, they're already what? They're already obsolete. Some of you that are in here this morning can remember the time when you would go to the record store and you would buy a record in order to play that music if you didn't want to listen to the radio. And you would go and, and pick out your favorite record at the record store, you would play that. And then those of you that remember that time, remember when things changed and you went to the eight tracks and then the eight tracks to the cassette tapes, and then cassette tapes to CDs, and then CDs now to MP3 players, and being able to have songs on our smartphones and songs on our computers. We don't even have to leave the house anymore if we want to purchase a song or if we want to purchase an album. You think about watching movies. Once they've been released from the movie theater, for years, if you wanted to rent one, you would go to your local Blockbuster Video or Movie Gallery or Hollywood Video, and you would go and you would rent a VHS. And you would take that VHS and you would take it home and you would pop it in the VCR. And that took place for about 30 years. And then we switched over to these round discs called DVDs. The DVDs have been on the scene for quite some time now. And then Blu-ray was the next big thing. And then now if you want to rent a movie, you don't even have to leave the comforts of your home. You can simply stream it online. And you can watch it on your computer, you can watch it on your tablet, you can watch it on your phone. And so when we think about those areas right there, we can see that our society is constantly changing. But it's unfortunate 
that there are those individuals that have the idea that because society is changing, that we've got to change in matters of religion as well. And one of the great motivations behind this mentality today is so that we don't lose the generation to come. You know, when we think about salvation, there are many that are softening the approach to what an individual has to do in order to be saved. And they will say, well, we've got to be more accepting. We've got to allow this, we've got to allow that. Otherwise, we're gonna lose that next generation. There are those that, that will say, well, you know, we've got to soften our approach on how we view marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And the reason is because the divorce rate continues to run rampant. And if we don't change with the times, but we're not going to be able to keep that next generation around. There's another subject that's become increasingly popular over the last several years, and that's the subject of homosexuality. You know, growing up in the 1980s, homosexuality was a subject that was kept very private. Homosexuality was a subject that was very embarrassing. Homosexuality was a subject that people kept in the closet. But you know what's happening today? More and more people are coming out of the closet. More and more people are being open with it. More and more people are being praised with it. Our young people are growing up in a day and age that's far different from mine and those of you that are 30 years and older. They are growing up in a day and age where they are having same-sex relationships shoved down their throat everywhere that they look. They can turn on the TV and there it's present. They can go to school and it's present there. They can view it through the media and it's present there, seeing numerous individuals endorsing it. And there are a number of religious groups that are saying, if we're going to be able to keep the next generation, we have to change what we believe on this subject. I said all of that to say this, that there are a number of individuals that feel as if we've got to change when it comes to worship as well. If we're going to be able to reach the masses, if we're going to be able to reach the next generation, then we've got to offer something in worship that's going to be appealing to them. But let me ask you this question. When it comes to worshiping God, does it matter how we worship Him? When it comes to worshiping God, can we worship Him in any way that we want to and have Him accept it? If we were to go out and ask a number of religious people today that very question, many of them would say, you can worship God whatever you, way that you want to, and He is going to accept it. Then there might be others that would say, no, God isn't going to accept it. But brethren and friends, here's the question that we really need to be asking ourselves. What does the truth say about worship? Well, what does God in His Word say about worship and worship that is pleasing to Him? This morning when we talk about the truth about worship, we're going to be asking ourselves three questions. We're going to be asking ourselves the question, what is worship? Then we're going to follow it with a question, what are the different types of worship that can be offered? And then finally, number three, is all of life worship? And hopefully by the end of this study this morning, we'll be able to have somewhat of a basic grasp of what the Word of God has to say about this very vital subject. Let's begin first of all with asking ourselves the question, what is worship? What is worship? When we think about this word worship, it is a word that's found 108 times in all of God's Word. 64 of those times, it's going to be found in the Old Testament, leaving us with 44 times being found in the New Testament. The word worship comes from the Greek word proskuneo. And it's a word that is defined as to kiss toward, 
an action out of humility or adoration. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia will define it this particular way. An act of, hom an act of honor, reverence, homage, thought, or feeling paid to someone or something. Now, I want you to remember some of those words and keep them in the back of your mind as we talk about worship and how this is something that is paid to someone or something. Now, that's going to bring us to our second question. And this question here, we're going to spend several minutes in it this morning. What are the different types of worship that can be found within the confines of of God's Word. Did you know that when we think about the history of worship and we study about it and we look through God's Word, well, when we consider its history, it can be traced back nearly to the beginning of time, all the way to Genesis chapter 4. And there you have the worship with Cain and Abel. And since that time in history, there have been numerous types of worship that have been offered. But really, when you boil it all down, there are only two basic types of worship. And I know that this, this next statement that I'm going to make to you is going to sound so profound. But here are the two types of worship. Number one, unacceptable worship. And number two, acceptable worship. That, that's really what it all boils down to. But when you look at the first century church, and you look at the way that apostasy, the falling away from the truth, took place, it generally took place in one of four areas. Number one, it would be in regards to the plan of salvation. There would be a departure there. Number two, it would be in regards to the organization of the church. Number three, it would be a departure because individuals weren't interested in godly living. The pull of the world was too great. But then number four, a departure would take place in regards to worship. And so that's going to bring us to our first type of worship this morning. And that is unacceptable worship. And when we start to break these down, the New Testament is going to reveal to us three basic types of unacceptable worship. The first one that we're going to notice this morning is what is known as will Worship. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, and let's read here what the Apostle Paul has to say beginning in verse 20. He says, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So here he's got a question. Why are you involved in these things? And then notice what he says next. Which things have indeed a show of will worship? You ever thought about what that means, what will worship means? Here's the basic idea of what it is. Will worship is one that is devised and prescribed for oneself. Man is devising his own worship, and he is prescribing his own worship. Basically, it boils down to what is pleasing to man. Some have described this as self-imposed worship or self-made worship. When you look here in the context at what Paul is writing about, He's writing about the fact that they are supposed to be dead to the world, but based on their fruits, you're not dead to the world. And not only are they still tied to the world, they are tied to this group known as the ascetics. How do we know that they're tied to this group? Look at that parenthetical phrase that's there. He says, touch not, taste not, handle not. This group was known for their self-denial. This group was known for their self-harm. One of the popular addictions today among young people is something known as self-harm or self-mutilization. And basically what that means 
is that there are some that have become addicted to cutting themselves. You know, some of the popular addictions would be alcohol and drugs and pornography and things along that line. But one of the ones that's very popular among young people today is this self-abuse. The original self-abusers were the ascetics. These were the cutters of the first century. These individuals, they would sleep on hard beds. They would go days without eating. They would whip themselves. They would go weeks and sometimes even months without talking. And all of this was done as a form of worship to God. And now you've got these brethren over here in Colossae that they are falling victim to this. And Paul is letting them know that this is something that man has prescribed. This is something that man has devised. And he's doing what is pleasing to him. This was not something that was authorized. This was not something that was ever found within God's Word. Now let's go back to that question. Can an individual worship God any way that he wants to and God accept it? If we simply look at Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23 alone, the answer would be no. You cannot worship God any way that you want to and have God accept it, contrary to popular thoughts of today's religious world. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 4 for just a moment. And as we go back to Genesis chapter 4, the second sin that is recorded in the Bible has to deal with worship. Genesis chapter 4, there at about verse 5, the Bible says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was wroth, he was angry, and his countenance fell. The Bible lets us know that God had respect. He accepted what Abel offered to him in worship. But when it came to Cain's offering, he rejected it. And so asking that question, can we bring anything before God in worship and have him accept it? The answer is no. And we see that from the very beginning of time in the second sin of the Bible and how it is in regards to worship. What did Cain do? Cain wanted to offer what he wanted to offer instead of what God wanted him to offer. Now let's turn over to Leviticus chapter 10. When you look over at Leviticus chapter 10 and you look at beginning in verse 1, we read about two brothers named Nadab and Abihu. They were the sons of Aaron. And the Bible says, they took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon. And they offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. What were they doing? They were worshiping God. But they were worshiping God in a way that God had not commanded them. They offered strange fire. You know what that means? Unacceptable fire, unauthorized fire. You go back to Exodus chapter 24, and God there prescribed exactly what it was and how they were to go about in worshiping Him. But you know what one of the popular thoughts is today? Whenever you talk to your religious neighbors about the subject of worship, and you try to point out the fact that, you know, the, the Scriptures, they don't authorize that in worship. You know what one of their common answers is? But the Bible doesn't say we can't. Where's your authority for that, Colossians 3 and verse 17? I don't need any authority because the Bible doesn't say that we can't do that. What if Nadab and Abihu were able to come back and speak today? What do you think they would say? God specified how He wanted worship and He didn't have to say anything else because it ruled out every other way. What if Cain could come back today? He would say God specified how He wanted work to be worshiped and it would rule out every other way. Let's think about it for just a moment in a secular way. Let's say that you and I, that we had to get some work done on our cars. And let's say that you had your, your passenger side front tire that needed to be replaced. And you took your car to the shop. You told the mechanic exactly what you wanted done. 
And when you came back to pick up that car, when he handed you the bill, not only had he replaced the right front tire, he replaced all the other tires, plus he gave you a tune-up. And now he's handed you the bill for all of that. Now, how are you going to respond to that? I didn't tell you to do all these other things. You specified one thing that you wanted that mechanic to do, and you know what that does? That rules out everything else. You didn't have to go through their list of jobs and say, now I want my passenger side front tire replaced, but don't you dare replace all the other tires. Don't you dare give me a tune-up. Don't you dare put another transmission in there. Don't you dare replace the engine. Don't do this. Don't do that. You don't have to go through and specify all those other things, do you? Because you had only authorized them to do one thing. Let's say that you wanted to get your house painted. My wife and I, we're trying to uh, get our house ready to put it on the market, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. And we've been getting estimates from painters to come in and paint some of the common areas in our house. And one of the, one of the colors that we have selected for that common area is a color called latte. It's, it's close, similar to this brown that you've got here, uh, maybe a little bit lighter than that. But let's say that we hire a painter and we tell that painter, now we want, you to cut, we want you to paint our house latte. We give him the keys and we leave the house and we come back later that day and we notice that he's got one part of the living room wall painted latte and then on the other side, he decides that he's going to paint the rainbow all across that room. You know what's gonna happen? We're gonna have some problems with his work. Why are we going to have some problems with his work? Because I told him the job that I wanted him to do. I told him the exact color that I wanted him to paint it. Any other color would be completely unacceptable. You and I understand secular logic. We understand secular reasoning. But a lot of times when you begin to move from secular reasoning and you talk about spiritual reasoning and you try to reason with people from the Word of God, you know what they take, where they take their logic? They take it and they throw it out the window. And they act as if logic does not apply to the Scriptures. If you go back to Genesis chapter 6 through 8 and you look at how God told Noah to build the ark, and he told him to build it out of gopher wood. Did God really have to tell Noah? Now, Noah, you make sure you don't build it out of oak. Noah, you make sure that you don't build it out of hickory. Noah, you make sure that, that you don't build it out of cedar. You make sure that you don't build it out. He didn't have to specify those other things because he told him to build it out of gopher wood. God has specified in his word how and, and what ways he wants us to worship. Do you know when it comes to singing in New Testament worship, all God has done to told us to do is to sing? He says, sing and make melody in your heart. Ephesians 5 and verse 19. You know what the instrument there is? The instrument is the heart. Sing and make melody. There's your prepositional phrase, in the heart. The object of the preposition is going to be the heart. There is your instrument. But you know, if you try to talk to some folks in the denominational world about it, you know what they'll say? Well, the Bible doesn't say that we can't use the instrument. No, God has specified you sing. And you know what that does? That removes everything else. What about this? What about the partaking of the Lord's Supper? And how we read in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 that we're to partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. And when you talk to individuals, they'll say, well, you know, I understand that it says that we're to take it, every first, uh, that we're to take it the first day of the week, but it doesn't say every first day of the week. But if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, the same phrase is going to be used, that we're to give of our means on the first day of the week. And you never seem to have any question about that from them in regards to the contribution. To me, it's, it's a mix-up with priorities. And then you'll have people say, well, you know, we don't take it every week for this reason. 
we feel as if it's going to lose its significance. Do you know that if you partake of the Lord's Supper the way that we're prescribed and commanded and told to take it according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it will never, ever lose its significance. Not one single time. Who causes it to lose its significance? We do. We have no authority to say, well, we're going to take the Lord's Supper once a quarter. We're going to take it once a month. But we're going to take it twice a year. That's when worship becomes will worship. When we worship God in a way that is pleasing to self. The other day I saw a picture of a denominational church sign. And on that church sign they had about five or six different worship styles offered. I wish I had taken a picture of it. But when you look at it, the very first one that started at 8 a.m., they called it the traditional service. At 9 a.m. they had what was known as the contemporary service. At 10 a.m., they had what was called the come-as-you-are service. At the 11 a.m., they had the no-questions-asked service. At the noontime, they had the postmodern service, and the list kept going on and on. Do you know what that is? That's will worship. It's worship that is pleasing to self. That brings us to a second unacceptable type, and this type is vain worship. When you look at Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9, Jesus said, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. What does that word vain there mean? It's a word that means empty. It's a word that means useless. Jesus said that a person's worship can be empty. So if we were to ask Jesus the question, can I worship God in any way that I want to and it be acceptable to Him, you know what Jesus would say? No. He would say there would be some whose worship is vain. It's empty and it's useless. Number three, there's what's known as ignorant worship. When you look at Acts chapter 17, You'll remember there that the Apostle Paul, that he has made his way into Athens. And as he goes into Athens, he surveys that this city is wholly given over to idolatry. They've got an idol for everything under the sun. And as he's going through there, he notices one that's very interesting, that they've got an altar to the unknown God. And when he gets up to preach there at Mars Hill, I want you to notice what he has to say. He says, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him declare I unto you. Here's the idea. They've got all of these gods and then they've got an altar here to the unknown God just in case we missed one. We've got one for him as well. Paul says, I want to talk to you about the one that you've missed. I want to talk to you about the one true and living God. And he was letting them know, you can't worship him properly if you don't know him. And so when you think about the three basic types of unacceptable worship, you have will worship, which is all about pleasing self. And we see that so much in our religious world today. You've got vain worship which is empty, which is useless. Jesus said they do it teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. Sometimes you ask people, well, what, well why do you worship this way? Well, that's what my church does. That, that's what, what we've been told to do. You know where they're getting that information? From their creed book. They're not getting it from this book. They're getting it from their creed book. Jesus says, that worship's vain. And then number three, there's ignorant worship. But let's move to a second major type of worship, and that's acceptable worship. Let's turn over to John chapter 4 and verse 24, and let's very quickly break down what Jesus has to say here. You'll remember that Jesus is in the midst of a discussion with a woman from Samaria. And as they are discussing things together, there is a topic that comes up in that discussion. Jesus wants to talk to her about worship. 
And when he talks to her about worship and the type of worship that's acceptable, number one, he tells her, you have to have the right object. You got to have the right object. God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him. You remember in the wilderness when Jesus was being tempted by the devil? And the devil was trying to get Jesus to do this, and there would be numerous individuals that would come and worship Him if, if He would do this. Remember how Jesus answered Him? He said, it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. That's going to rule out everybody else. That's going to rule out Muhammad. That's going to rule out Buddha. That's going to rule out Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's going to rule out worshiping angels. There's only one object to be worshiped. There's only one individual, and that is God the Father. You remember when we were defining our terms, what is worship? It's an act of homage, an act of reverence paid to someone or something. Jesus said, when you come together to worship, you're to worship the right object, and that's God. Number two, you're to have the right attitude. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him. How? In spirit. My attitude's got to be right when I come and worship God. Do you know that there are some, when they come to worship, they don't have the right attitude? Perhaps there could even be some of those that are in here this morning. That there may be some that don't want to be here. There may be some that could not care less what goes on today. That there may be some that are here only because their spouse wants them here. I'm here so that my spouse will stay off my back. I'm here only because mama and daddy are making me be here so that they'll stay off my back. There are some that are in here in body only, but their, their minds are miles and miles away. There may be some that may look at worship as simply just punching the clock. I've put in my hour today, I've put in my time. If we're looking at worship in those ways, we've got the wrong attitude. And he says that our, our attitude can't be right or wrong and our worship be right. But that brings us to a third thing that's involved. You've got to have the right object. You've got to have the right attitude. But notice what he says, number three, you've got to do it in the right way. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And in truth. Do you know what the truth is? Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. I've got to be doing it according to what this word has to say. And when I do it according to what this word has to say, I'm going to find five acts that are going to be part of worship in the church in the New Testament. I'm going to find a book, chapter, and verse or when we come together, that we're to sing praises to God, that we're to give of our means, that we're to partake of the Lord's Supper, that when we come together, that we're going to pray together. When we come together, we're going to study God's Word together as the preacher preaches. And we can find all five of those acts in the New Testament. We can find scriptures that go with every single one. When Jesus said... That when we come together to worship God, we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That word and connects them two together. We can't just have the right attitude. We can't just simply be sincere and forget about the truth. We can't just have the truth and forget to have the right attitude. I think at times as members of the Lord's church, we fall into this trap and we get so focused on the truth that we forget to have the right attitude as well. But then the roles are reversed when you think about those in the denominational world. They get so focused on having the right attitude. What do they forget about? They forget about the truth. You can't have one without the other. You've got to have both, and you have to have the right object in order for our worship to be acceptable to God. 
But that's going to bring us to question number three. And very quickly, we're going to ask ourselves the question, is all of life worship? Is all of life worship? What if we were to ask that question to people in, in the world? Is all of life worship? Some people might say, well, yes. All of life is worship to God. Anything from cutting the grass to changing a diaper to, to cooking a meal to shopping at the store, all of that is, is worship. Then you might ask some others the question, is all of life worship? Well, no, not all of life is worship. I want us to look at three basic passages from the Old Testament and then we'll close our lesson out. Let, let's go back to Genesis chapter 22 for a minute. Genesis 22 and verse 5, we're going to see a worship that Abraham engaged in. The Bible says here, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Do you see what he said? He told his young men, he said, Y'all stay here. Me and the lad, me and Isaac, we're going to go over there and we're going to go and worship, and then we'll come back to you. What they were doing before time wasn't worship. Then they went and worshiped, worshiped ended, and then they came back. Very quickly, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 19. Here we're going to see worship that Elkanah has with his family. They arose up early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house to Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. See what happens. They got up, they went to worship, they came back home. Not everything that they were doing was considered to be worship. There's a beginning and there's an end. And one final passage this morning. Let's turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And when we look at verse 20, we're going to notice that David has been worshiping. The Bible says, Then David arose from the earth, washed and anointed himself, changed his apparel, came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house. When he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Do you see all what David did? He arose, he washed, he anointed, he changed his clothes. He got himself ready is what the text is saying. He went and worshiped. After worship, what did he do? He went and ate. There was something he was doing before worship. He worshiped. And then after worship concluded, he went and did something else. Isn't that what we do? We get ourselves ready. Then we come, we worship, then we leave, and oftentimes we go eat. That's exactly what David was doing. Brethren and friends, as we bring our study to a close this morning, and, and we ask ourselves the question, well, what does the truth say about worship? The truth lets us know that there are two basic types of worship. That there's an unacceptable type of worship and there is an acceptable type of worship. And let's make sure that our worship is according to this word. And if our worship is according to this word right here, it'll be acceptable every single time. If we have a thus saith the Lord behind it, God is going to approve of it. But any time we do something that's not found in this word that's unauthorized, it's going to be unacceptable. God is not going to accept that worship. And so we better make sure that we've got book, chapter, and verse in regards to it. As we close our study today, we want to extend our Lord's invitation. The Bible is a book about good news. Because it's the good news that God wants all mankind to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. The Bible tells us that He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross. And the Bible tells us that through the shedding of that blood, that our sins can be forgiven. But the only way that our sins can be forgiven is by coming to God according to the truth. The Bible tells us if we'll believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8 and verse 24. If we'll be willing to repent of our sins, Acts 17 and verse 30. If we'll make the great confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8 and verse 37. And be baptized into Christ so that our sins can be washed away, Acts 22 and verse 16. The blood of Jesus 
It'll wash those sins away according to Revelation 1 and verse 5. One thing that you'll never read about in the truth is the sinner's prayer. That's the most popular form of salvation that's being taught in our religious world today. But you can look from cover to cover in this book right here and you will never find one instance of an individual praying and receiving salvation. But you will find individuals obeying the gospel. And they'll obey the gospel in the way that we just talked about there. Maybe it's the case that you're here this morning. And as you look at your life, you realize, you know, there are some things that are amiss. At one point I was faithful, but right now I'm living unfaithfully. And I'm ready today through repentance and prayer to make my life right with God once again. 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. If we can help you in any way, whether it's in obedience to the gospel or coming back to the fold through repentance and prayer, won't you come forward as together we stand and as we sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of